This is Formation, a podcast from Mundelein Seminary. This episode is a rector reflection from Father John Karchi, rector of Mundelein Seminary. Let's suppose that you go outside in the early evening on December 21st, 2020. Now, maybe you're not somebody who spends a lot of time looking at the sky. You generally just run from your car to your home, into your business, the restaurant, and then back out. So unless it's a full moon or a solar eclipse, you're not generally paying much attention to what's going on overhead. But I guarantee you, if you're out in the early evening on December 21st, and you happen to be looking in the southwestern direction, a little bit above the horizon, depending on what latitude you're at, I guarantee you, you will be stopped in your tracks because you'll notice an incredibly bright, what you might think is a star there in the sky. And other than the moon or the sun, it's probably going to be as bright or brighter than anything you've seen before. That's going to strike you and you're gonna know something's going on. Maybe you'll watch it for a while to see if it's a plane, but you notice it's not moving. And in all likelihood, if you have the chance, you'll go look it up. You'll Google it. You'll ask a friend. Something is going on there that you didn't expect, and you can't just let it go by uninvestigated. Let's say now you're the sort of person who is outdoors fairly regularly. Um, And looking at the sky is something, you know, that you do from time to time. Let's say you walk your dog every evening or you get home from work in the evening and you like to take a little stroll before winding down for the night. Well, if that's you, then you've been noticing in the days and weeks leading up to December 21st that in the sky there are two particularly bright lights. And you'll notice that one of them seems to be approaching, quote unquote, the other light in the sky. And as you take your walk, you know, night after night, you notice it's just getting a little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer. And soon it starts to dawn on you, hey, these two are going to line up. You know, it's almost going to look like they're crashing into each other. And you know, that's not happening. It's just projected on the sky. But you're anticipating it. You're waiting for it. And you're getting closer and closer to the 21st, you're probably guessing, boy, that's the day, you know, something's going to happen. So when you go out that night, you're going to be looking, you're going to be looking to see what is this, what does this look like when they come together? And then if you keep walking your dog or whatever in the subsequent days, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, you're going to notice that that moving light after that point of closest approach then just seems to move on and leave the other light behind. Finally, let's imagine that you're an avid astronomy buff. You're somebody who looks at the sky with great intentionality very regularly. Then you know that those two bright lights in the sky are not stars, they're planets. In particular, they're the planets Jupiter and Saturn. And for all these days and weeks leading up to December 21st, What's been happening is that in their projection on the sky, Jupiter is approaching Saturn and eventually overtaking it. On December 21st, Jupiter and Saturn, from our field of view, will be the closest that they appear on the entire journey of Jupiter. It's what's known as a planetary conjunction. And you'll know that. You'll be anticipating it. You'll be excited about it because you'll know that this particular conjunction is pretty unusual for a number of reasons. But my point is, you're going to be going out with great intentionality, with great expectation. You don't know exactly what it's going to look like until you see it, but you do have a sense of what you expect. And based on the history of what astronomy has told us, uh, you have a reason for having some understanding of what's going on there and you're excited to be a part of it. So there you have it, three different observers looking at exactly the same phenomenon, but drawing from that experience three very different levels of understanding. As is so often the case when we talk about faith and science, yes, we can use the observation of the natural world that science gives us maybe give us a greater appreciation of the glory of God 
And that's a beautiful way to use science. It's a beautiful way to be enriched by science. But I also think we should pay attention to the way scientists look at the world. And that's all I want to spend a minute or two talking about. The example of what's coming up on December 21st, the great conjunction of the planets Jupiter and Saturn, and how that can be a window into the way astronomers encounter mystery and what that can help tell us about the way people of faith encounter God. They move in parallel tracks, and there's a lot that we as believers can learn from our astronomical friends. So first, let's just be clear about the science. Uh, a conjunction uh, is a result of the fact that all the planets, of course, are orbiting around the sun, uh, and they're moving at different speeds. So that means that at any given time, uh, any two planets are a certain distance apart from each other, and there's going to be a moment on their respective orbits when they are the closest together for that particular orbital cycle. If this sounds kind of confusing, uh, just go online, look up planetary conjunction, and as soon as you see a diagram, it'll be very clear. So seen from Earth, when we view the conjunction of two planets, it's going to look to us as if uh, those planets are very close together, or astronomers say they're aligned on the sky. How close they look to each other uh, is a function of uh, where we're at the time of year, the exact placement uh, of the planets in their orbits, and so forth. And so consequently, every time we view a conjunction between the same two planets, they're not always going to look exactly the same. Furthermore, we may be viewing the conjunction of those planets uh, at a time when they are aligning on uh, with the sun to our back, so to speak, so we see them in the nighttime, and obviously then we can view them. But at other times, the conjunction might be in the direction of the sun, so that that alignment uh, is only happening in our field of view during daylight, and we don't see them at all because it's simply washed out by the bright sunlight. So the conjunction that's going to happen on December 21st is somewhat unusual uh, for two reasons. One, it happens in the evening, so clearly visible in the sky after sunset. But the second point is that the orbits are just right such that as we view the conjunction on the sky, the planets Jupiter and Saturn are going to appear extremely close together. In fact, they'll be separated by less than one-fifth of the width of a full moon. Uh, now, if you have good eyesight and it's a clear night and the atmosphere isn't too jumpy, uh, you should easily be able to distinguish that, in fact, it's two lights. You'll be able to separate out um, uh, the light of each planet. They'll seem extremely close together. But if your eyesight isn't so good or if the atmosphere is a little bit more active, um, then it's entirely possible that you might see that as simply one very bright a sort of blob, right? It looked like a very bright star, perhaps, in the sky. Uh, but that's the science, and uh, as Jupiter has been moving on its orbit and Saturn, Saturn moving on its orbit, Jupiter is much closer to us, um, and so consequently it appears as if Jupiter is, quote, closing in on Saturn and eventually overtaking it. Although in point of fact, the two planets will be separated by nearly half a billion miles uh, apart from each other, but on the sky, they'll appear very close together. So that's the science of a conjunction. Now, fascinating question is how these conjunctions have been interpreted over the years. You might think that this is an extremely rare event and you know, almost never happens. Um, and in fact, if you've been following the news, uh, you've probably seen that the last time a conjunction of this nature, where they're so close together uh, in the evening sky, conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn has happened. You have to go all the way back to the year 1226 AD. And so by that standard, it would seem like this is an incredibly rare event, maybe just once a millennium or so. Uh, so how long would we have to wait for this to happen again? You know, the last time was in 1226. Well, it so happens that the next time this kind of alignment uh, 
will occur between Jupiter and Saturn uh, is going to be in the year 2080 AD. So in other words, a mere 60 years from now. Uh, well, how can that be? Well, the result is these conjunctions are simply a function of the physics of the orbiting of the planets around the sun. And there's nothing more exotic than that. Uh, it turns out that between the year zero and the year 3000 AD, conjunctions of the nature of what we'll see on December 21st uh, will have happened about seven times. Um, and so as you can see, the, the spacing is hardly uniform uh, over the, the years and the centuries. But nevertheless, what happens on the 21st will be unusual uh, because of the relative brightness uh, of the planets when they're together and how close they'll be uh, passing each other on the sky. You might also notice, though, that this is happening on December 21st, which is uh, an important date for us on Earth, because every year, December 21st, or very close to it, we celebrate the winter solstice. And so you might think, well, okay, is this an event that only happens on the winter solstice? Maybe that's what makes it special. And the answer to that is no, that's just purely coincidental. In fact, when the conjunction happened in the year 1226, it happened on March 4th. So the fact that it's happening in this year, the fact that it's happening on the date of the winter solstice, again, is simply a product of the physics. Um, and it's nothing more exotic than that. But astrologers, not astronomers, right, but astrologers, uh, people who try to um, attribute great significance, powers of good, evil, and so forth to the heavenly bodies, um, they've looked at these conjunctions uh, over the years and tried to argue that they are in some way responsible for momentous events on Earth. And one thing that has been suggested is that perhaps a conjunction of the kind we're going to see on December 21st, which is obviously very close to when we celebrate Christmas, perhaps that was responsible for the Star of Bethlehem, the so-called Star of Bethlehem, as Matthew describes it uh, in his Gospel. Well, using the physics of astronomy, you know, we can run the clock backwards, so to speak, um, and actually recreate uh, in a planetarium or computer model uh, what the conjunction would have appeared like around the time of Jesus. And in fact, we know that one of these conjunctions would have happened in the year 7 BC, and then the next one would have happened uh, in the year 14 AD. Uh, in fact, conjunctions occur about every 20 years between Jupiter and Saturn. We don't always see them, as I said, because many times, uh, as viewed from Earth, they're in the direction of the Sun, and so they're simply not visible to us. So even though, depending on how the calculations are done, um, it's often uh, thought that Jesus' birth by our current calendar may have been around the year 3 or 4 BC, um, the dates of the conjunctions that happened around the time of Jesus' birth really don't quite work out, the 7 BC, 14 AD. Furthermore, and perhaps more significantly, uh, the separation between Jupiter and Saturn uh, would be considerably larger than what we're going to see on December 21st. And so they would not at all have appeared as one sort of bright star. Uh, and finally, the conjunction doesn't move, the conjunction itself. And you'll notice this. If you're out looking at the sky before December 21st and you go out after December 21st, you'll see Jupiter approach Saturn. They'll have that one night of conjunction and then Jupiter will move on and the separation will grow. So nothing like described uh, in the Gospel of Matthew where you have one bright star uh, suddenly appearing and then seeming to travel or move um, across the sky as the Magi observed it on successive evenings. Uh, so while it is attractive that the conjunction is happening this year so close to Christmas Day, um, there's really no reason for thinking that it is responsible for uh, the Star of Bethlehem as Matthew described it. But as I was saying earlier, you know, you don't have to go to astrology to glean something useful in the spiritual life from an event like the Great Conjunction uh, that we'll be seeing on the 21st. 
And what I suggest, and I think this is often the case when we talk about faith and science, is rather than only focusing on how the scientific observations you know, somehow point to the existence of God or reveal the glory of God, uh, and the universe and all its creation does reflect the glory of God. It certainly does that for me. But go beyond that and instead look at, or in addition, look at how do scientists engage mystery? How do scientists treat what they observe? And there can be some very useful lessons for us in the spiritual life. So it always begins with a basic observation, right? So if you think about how I open this reflection, the, the three kinds of people who might look up on December 21st, there are those who are simply blindsided by it, right? They, they haven't been observant uh, at all. They don't make a practice of looking at the sky, and all of a sudden this bright light occurs, uh, and they're caught unawares. And they jump to conclusions about what it might be, or they go out and they seek other people's opinions. Uh, maybe they would seek out an astrologer, right? And, and maybe they would come to the conclusion that, wow, there is some uh, momentous existential meaning behind this planetary event, which of course is utter nonsense within the context of our Catholic theology. Uh, well, in the spiritual life, we can be the same way, not attentive, not watching. And then when things happen that do catch our attention, we're often at a loss to try and understand how God could be a part of that. Or we jump to conclusions that we really aren't justified in drawing. Um, so an example that comes to mind um, is a, a bad event, a tragedy, a something very sad. Uh, maybe it's an illness. Uh, maybe a relationship has been weakening over time and, and all of a sudden you know, it, it ruptures. One person leaves, withdraws. Uh, just things that uh, we haven't been watching for, we haven't been looking out for the signs of. Think about this current year, uh, the pandemic itself. Um, well, most of us didn't see it coming, but you know, epidemiologists, people who study such things, they know that pandemics do happen. They've happened before, we're in the midst of one now, and unfortunately, they're likely to happen again. So even though they couldn't exactly predict when it would happen, um, they were on the lookout for such things, and they were thinking about how they might address the moment when it comes. And so it is in the spiritual life, to not be caught unawares by events, because we are watching, we are sensitive to, you know, where are the movements of, of people, of events? Um, what is going on in my life? Can I be aware? The second type of person who looks up on December 21st, as we said, is someone who is somewhat aware, and they have noticed that you have these two bright lights in the sky, and they're approaching each other, uh, and they can see the rate at which they're approaching. And so come December 21st, that's about when they expected uh, to see uh, the conjunction occurring. And they don't know exactly what it would look like, but they're curious about that, and they make an effort to go out and look. Um, and they can enjoy the event as it happens, because they have, to some degree, expected it. And in the spiritual life, we can often live that way. We're, we're somewhat attentive, right? Maybe not always so much, but when something starts to appear on the horizon, Again, let's go back to a relationship. Maybe in a wonderful way, it's growing, and the two people are growing in trust and intimacy. Well, one or both of them starts to notice that in its nascent form. You know, little baby steps. Trust is growing, the friendship is deepening, and it's moving in a certain direction. And the heart and mind long for that direction. You know, we desire that it would grow. We take steps to try and nurture it and foster it. Um, we don't have a crystal ball, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but there is an expectancy and there is a certain intentionality. And we can ask ourselves, Lord, where are you in the midst of this? Or we can pray, we can ask, Lord, I want you to be a part of this. We can bring it into our prayer. We can talk about it with trusted friends. Um, and it's not just the good things, it can also be troubling moments as well. Again, think about this past summer, all the social unrest, the riots, uh, the fighting. Well, some people were just completely caught off guard. 
right? Like the person who never looks at the sky and then all of a sudden, wow, there's something extraordinary on December 21st. But others saw the signs of the times. Others paid attention to social struggles, paid attention to the marginalized, paid attention to the fact that some people by their own choice are just oblivious to anyone who might be suffering or struggling. They saw things coming um, and maybe took steps to try and address them, but knew that their efforts and the efforts of others were not going to be adequate to meet the tensions that would be coming and exacerbated by everything else that happened uh, this year. So that too is a way to be. But as I said, it's maybe just sort of a soft awareness and not somebody who's giving all their time and attention. So they, they can see that something is coming, but they're still rather surprised when it all comes to a head. And they can invite God to be a part of that, or they may look for God's presence, um, but it isn't something that they necessarily do with great intentionality. Um, you know, it's kind of a casual, you know, Lord, please help this work out okay, or gee, Lord, you know, I, I know you help some people, maybe you don't help other people the same way. So it's kind of a self-created theology, if you like. And then you have the third type of person, right? The, the astronomer, the avid astronomer, who uh, has really thought about and studied and learned from mentors, tries to draw on the wisdom of those who've gone before her or him, uh, and they have some understanding, a fairly deep understanding, of what's going on around them. And so when Jupiter and Saturn begin first appearing in the night sky, they're looking for it, they're anticipating it, and they notice when you know they come into view, and they track and they follow those moments. And then with great anticipation, you know, they go out on the night of conjunction and they really can enjoy what is happening with happening with a great expectation, even though they don't know in advance exactly what it's going to look like. So there is that moment and joy and surprise of discovery, but it's something which has been anticipated uh, using the intellect and the mind and the wisdom that they've drawn upon. Well, in the spiritual life, that opportunity is also extended to us. And we don't have to be great theologians or spiritual mystics to avail ourselves of this. Uh, it's simply using the fact that if we are sensitive and attentive to the thoughts, the feelings, the desires, the actions of the people around us, as well as those movements in our own mind and hearts, uh, then we do notice when larger movements begin to start with smaller steps. We notice those who are suffering. We hear the cry of the poor. We notice uh, those who are on the margins. And this isn't just material poverty. It may be emotional through depression, isolation, addictions, all the different signs that can ultimately lead to uh, momentous events. And similarly, we notice small joys. We notice little actions of gratitude, um, expressions of appreciation, uh, Christian happiness, right? Which is not always affective, you know, bouncing off the walls with, with giddiness, but it's a simple appreciation of hope and the presence of the Lord. And so we watch for those things. We do what we can to nurture them or to bring comfort where there is suffering. And we see how it evolves and develops over time as people interact with one another, as we are willing to face our own weaknesses as well as celebrate our strengths and our gifts so that as things do evolve over time, we're not caught unawares. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know exactly how everything is going to ultimately come to a head. But when those moments do happen, uh, we're able to respond, at least in a much better way than we would have otherwise if we weren't paying attention. And spiritually, we've invited God to be a part of that from the very beginning. Even on days when it doesn't seem like great momentous events are unfolding, just a simple reflection on what's happened this day, what's transpired over the last 24 hours, to gently bring that before the Lord in our prayer, 
to always be asking, Lord, help me see your presence. Help me see your presence in the people around me. Help me see your presence in the cries for help. Help me see your presence in those who are living on the margins, uh, on those who are in need of greater attention or generosity or love or compassion. If we watch for those things attentively, the Lord does help reveal them to us, and we can act uh, with anticipation. We can act with a sense of hope. You know, just like the astronomer who better focuses uh, his telescope on the planets as they're getting closer and actually does the calculations necessary uh, to better observe, to better assess what's happening. We too can better attune, right, our, our spiritual radar. We can increase the compassion and gratitude of our hearts the more we engage uh, those qualities of our minds and hearts. And the last thing I would just say is that the astronomer always starts with the basic truths that she or he knows to be real, right? So the astronomer starts with the basic truth that these little lights in the sky, they are planets and they are moving around the sun in fixed orbits. I start with that as my non-negotiable truth. You know, we've developed that truth over many years, okay, study hu human, uh, human efforts, exercise of our intellects. Uh, but if I start with that, now I have a very solid foundation on which to try and understand something that maybe I wasn't expecting to see, right? Like a conjunction, okay? So the first time a conjunction was observed in the wake of Copernicus's you know, revolutionary insight that the planets move around the sun, that gave a whole new way of understanding what those lights in the sky were doing. Well, similarly, for us as Christians, we have fundamental truths that we can use to help us understand some of the more mysterious things, uh, at least what is perceived as mysterious around us. So for example, we know we truly believe as fundamental to our faith that every human being, every man, woman, and child is made in the image and likeness of God. And that God is a trinity of persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And as the first letter of John tells us, that God is love. Put all of that together. Every human being is in the image and likeness of a Trinitarian God who is love. That's an extraordinary set of truths. And what that means is that every person you encounter is wired, if you like. They're wired to be in relationship. They are wired to give and receive love. And so to the degree that that might not be happening, then something is amiss. And there is the possibility for us to enter in and help that person be more receptive of God's love. Invite that person to share of themselves more fully perhaps than they have. And so in the face of what can often seem a mystery, like why is there suffering in the world? Why is a, a beautiful little child having to undergo a terrible illness or the loss of their parents? Uh, why is it that really good, generous people can lose their jobs or in the midst of this summer, you know, people losing their elderly parents to the ravages of COVID? Why are these things happening? That can strike us a little bit like the person who, without any previous preparation, sees the bright light in the sky and they've never noticed anything before. And all of a sudden they're dumbfounded that something must be wrong, this shouldn't be happening. Well, in fact, even in the face of great suffering, while we can't magically take that suffering away, we certainly can address it because we know that the suffering person is wired. They are in the image and likeness of a Trinitarian God who is love. They are wired in the very core of their being to receive love and in turn to give it. And how do we help someone, you know, better make use of that truth? Well, we engage them. We interact with them. We love them. We let them know that we care. And we allow ourselves to be known and loved and trusted in return. I don't want to be naive here. I don't want to pretend that that's an easy thing or that that magically takes away the pain of suffering. But it is transformative. 
and it truly does make a difference. If you study the history of science, you know that it is full of paradigm shifting moments when truly extraordinary revolutions uh, were in breaking because of a new way of seeing what had been observed perhaps for hundreds and thousands of years. And suddenly there's a new way of seeing it and a deeper understanding. What the Christian truths bring to our humanity is no less revolutionary. But the question is, are we willing to engage those truths as freely and with as much confidence as the astronomer engages the truths that she has received over the centuries from all those wise observers who've gone before her? So please, by all means, go out on the evening of December 21st and look up in the southwestern sky. You truly are in for a treat. And now, if you didn't know before, hopefully you have a deeper understanding of the extraordinary astronomical events that are happening to produce that sight. But after you've ceased gazing at the sky, then lower your gaze, and with no less wonder, with no less anticipation, and with no less a sense of intentionality to understand and engage, lower your gaze and look at the people around you. Those are conjunctions as well. The closest approach of the woman and the man in your midst. And as C.S. Lewis wonderfully wrote in his little essay, The Weight of Glory, outside of the Blessed Sacrament, the holiest thing in your presence is the woman or man within your reach. May God bless you on December 21st, and throughout this entire Christmas season. Thank you for listening and subscribing to Formation, a podcast from Wonderline Seminary. We appreciate your support. If you would like to receive Father John Carchi's Rector Reflections via email, you can sign up at usml.edu slash rector hyphen reflections. Together with you in Christ, we are Wonderline. We form parish priests.